Hello. I'm hoping you're having a wonderful day, a blessed day. And now I want to share with you um, the book of Luke. And we're going to start the way we've been starting with Luke, and that is with Luke's purpose. Remember, his purpose is given uh, at the very end of the book. And uh, let's read it again. If we go to Luke 24, you can listen. Uh, it's on the road to Emmaus where Jesus appears to the two characters there who um, who are devastated by um, uh, the fact that Jesus died. It's been three days and then they're hearing all these uh, uh, records of uh, people seeing Jesus in an empty tomb. So uh, there be there. They're, they just don't know what to do about it. And Jesus comes to them. And he said to them in verse 25, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. He's saying, you're not believing in what the prophets said. Was it not necessary? It was necessary, according to the prophets. Um, was it not necessary for the Christ the Messiah, to suffer these things and enter into his glory. Then beginning with Moses, Moses, uh, uh, and with all the prophets, because Moses was a prophet, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Those are the scriptures from the Old Testament. He took... Uh, the narratives from the Old Testament opened them up and showed them to these two men uh, that Jesus was to come and what happened to Jesus was necessary. Um, and they fulfilled scripture. So last week we looked at some stories that weren't even in Luke because you see the other books, Matthew, Mark, John, all of them had the same purpose to show that Jesus was fulfilling Old Testament scripture. And so when we went to uh, John, we saw that um, the story about the bronze serpent was really, according to John 3, a story about Jesus Christ. Uh, it pictured what Jesus Christ would do. And so Jesus could have said, I am the bronze serpent. And then if you went um, to the beginning of John, where Nathaniel um, gets introduced to Jesus, Jesus gives uh, an Old Testament story. And that story is from the life of Jacob. When Jacob was running away in fear of his brother, and he fell asleep and saw a ladder. The, that reached from heaven to earth and the angels were ascending and descending on this ladder. And that remind, uh, told us that Jesus was the ladder. He could have said, I am the ladder because he is the way to heaven. And then we looked at uh, Mark and the bread stories that pictured uh, Jesus as a, both um, a Moses and an Elisha uh, with the bread situation and uh, there being a, a miracle of loaves and then leftovers, just as uh, Mark portrayed uh, of Jesus in the feeding of the 4,000. There were loaves of bread provided for all the people and leftovers also. So uh, we, we have these stories from the Old Testament uh, that picture the future Messiah and I just want to continue with that at, as part of our snippet and we're going to look this time in the book of Matthew. Uh, so if you could take out the paper that has two columns one uh, from Genesis 35 and one from Matthew. 
And um, in fact, uh, right after Genesis 35, we have Jeremiah 31. What I'm going to do is have you uh, pause this, and I want you to read the two columns, circling that which uh, is common to all the three columns, okay? Would you do that for me? And you're going to see something really special. Okay, you're back. Great. And we are looking at the story from Genesis 35, and we see the story of Rachel. She is in labor. Now, this labor is so difficult, so supra, um, uh, just completely more difficult than was common in that day. Now, remember, they weren't cloistered in a hospital when they gave birth. The whole community really was a part of any birthing situation. Men and women alike would at least hear what was going on in the tent. You know how we are. There were there was no um, you know injection to make it easier for them to have this baby. Uh, they had it all natural, and so um, it, it was uh, very common for there to be um, a quite a loud uh, noise from uh, the tent where the. Um, new mother was going to have her child. Now, that's why when when um, the author, Moses, of Genesis 35 talks about this labor, he makes you know that this was uh, a, an uncommonly difficult labor. Now, how does he do that? Well, if you go back to to verse 16 and 17, it tells you three times about her labor. And each time it gets worse. He says, Rachel went into labor uh, and she had hard labor. And then when the labor was at its hardest, th this was a horrible, heinous, painful labor. In fact, it was so painful that she died from it. And when she died, she uh, uh, just before she died, she gave the little boy that was being born uh, a name, and that name was Benoni, which means son of my woe. Now, woe was a word that was often um, a link to um, uh, the word uh, lament, uh, mourning, crying. And so when Jeremiah saw this story, he realized that this story pictured what was happening during his time in a... Um, in another situation, does anybody know uh, uh, what was going on in the time of Jeremiah? Well, if you guessed the Babylonian captivity, you're right. And he, in his picture of the horror of the Babylonian captivity, he takes the picture of Rachel delivering and her grief and sorrow and lament and brings it to describe this story to show the heinousness of what was happening because he wants us to recognize how horrible it was for the mothers of, of uh, the Israelite mothers uh, going into captivity. Now this is what was happening in the captivity uh, what the Babylonian soldiers did was they um, captured and brought together um, the mothers, fathers, children from all over uh, the southern kingdom, uh, brought them together to a place called Rama, which was uh, not far from Bethlehem, just north of Bethlehem. And... Uh, it was there that they were brought together and um, 
the sick, the lame, uh, those who potentially would uh, bring um, uh, the march down to a, uh, a slow pace, were all gotten rid of, including infants. And what they would do was so awful, uh, they would just kill those infants, uh, twirl the infants around and slam them, their heads against rocks was a common occurrence. And, uh, and mothers weeping uncontrollably uh, at the death of their babies, as we would reap, weep, at the same kind of weeping that Rachel did, that grief that caused her even to name her child for that grief, Benoni, son of my woe, son of my grief, my sorrow, my lament. And then along comes Matthew with a story about Jesus. And this story about Jesus was in the time of Herod. And the same thing was happening at the time of Herod, Matthew realizes, as what happened at the time of Jeremiah with the Babylonian captivity, as what happened with Rachel in Genesis. All these Matthew saw as pictures of what was happening at the time of Jesus Christ. And so he quotes Jeremiah and he says, A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. That same kind of grief, that same kind of lament, that same kind of woe that happened in the Babylonian captivity was happening again in Bethlehem, a small little town that was just south of Ramah, uh, where uh, uh, the, 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 the murder of children took place. That was what was taking place at the time of Herod. Herod was the cruel taskmaster. And so we can see that uh, Rachel, is uh, her story is analogous to all the Israelite mothers during the Babylonian captivity, which was analogous to uh, the Bethlehemite mothers at the time of Herod. There's only one pro problem, though. Uh, there's a, a kind of reversal going on here. What? Well, did anybody see that? Did you see that there was a, a reversal going on here? Well, I hope some of you did. It was the reversal in the story of Rachel because it's not Rachel's babies who are dying. It's Rachel herself. Whereas in the story in Jeremiah and the story of Matthew, uh, it's the babies that are dying. So why would Jeremiah and Matthew link their story to the Rachel story? I think it's, uh, it's tied in with the lament of Rachel uh, that tied it all together uh, with the lament of the mothers. Um, when my Rachel uh, was dying of cancer, one of the one of the uh, reasons why she cried every once in a while, she was not a crier, my Rachel was very strong, but she did cry over the fact that she would be leaving her children. Yeah, It uh, caused her great grief because she knew uh, that no one could love her children as she did. And she did not want to leave them alone without a mother. She lamented and grieved as Rachel in Genesis lamented and grieved, knowing that her sons would be left to Leah, left to a, a father who, uh, uh, and you know how fathers are, who w would not be a mother to her children. And she grieved and lamented that she would be torn from her children as the children in um, um, uh, southern Israel during the time of the Babylonian 
uh, captivity would be torn, ripped apart from their mothers. And the children during the time of Herod and Jesus would be torn, ripped apart from uh, uh, their mothers. That's what Jeremiah wanted to capture, that grief at the tearing away of children from their mother. So, the story of Jesus is pictured in the Old Testament. So let's go on uh, with the next uh, uh, story from, from uh, Matthew. And uh, that column, uh, there's two columns again on this page, Daniel 6 and Matthew 26. And again, I want you to read it uh, silently, figure out what's the same about both columns, and then come up back to us, okay? Well, some of you who have been with me a long time know that this is bits and pieces of what we've studied um, in the book of Daniel, and that's called uh, Daniel's Resurrection Story. Uh, I've only taken those things, though, that are recorded in Matthew. If we were to go to Luke and Mark and John, we would see so much more that um, is are, are pictures of what happened in Daniel 6. And I hope you were as shocked as I was when I first heard it from my professor in seminary. So he, let's look at some of the common elements you probably uh, would like to tell me, wouldn't you? Well, uh, I have to go over it uh, for you. Uh, one is uh, Daniel prayed three times a day, and it was a, a part of his regular thing. Um, and in Matthew, it tells us that Jesus prayed three times, didn't he? Um, um, Another uh, thing that is common with both of them is that uh, their enemies came to arrest Daniel, Jesus, at that time of prayer. Um, um, then uh, if we go even further with that, uh, remember the king in Daniel is trying, struggling to free Daniel uh, well, he's analogous to Pilate, isn't he? What did Pilate do? Well, he tried to free, release Jesus, didn't he? And then um, in the Daniel story, which I think is that climactic moment that uh, gets us all excited, there's a stone that's rolled in front of the den and a seal put on that stone. And the same thing happens in the Matthew story. A stone is rolled in front of Jesus' tomb and a seal placed on it. And we know that both of them are going to uh, be resurrected, brought out. Yes. Okay, so Daniel, Jesus is analogous to Daniel. The government officials are analogous to Judas and the religious leaders. The king is analogous to Pilate. The den is analogous to the tomb. The stone is analogous to the stone in the Jesus story. And the seal is analogous to the seal. So we have these stories and, uh, and, and they match up to the Old Testament. I would like you to uh, see something else though here. Uh, in Luke, prayer precipitates great things happening. But prayer does not always precipitate a yes from God. Now, um, how do these two stories demonstrate this? You're right. Uh, the Daniel story. Daniel prayed three times. He's still thrown into the lion's den, isn't he? Jesus prayed three times. He's still crucified on a cross, isn't he? That's a no from God. Two great men receive a resounding no from God. And remind you of the no's you've received from God? 
Even the Son of God got a no from his father. Even the great Daniel got a no from Yahweh. Okay, but God, for those who loved him, and for those who love him today, worked all these things, even though they were evil things. He worked them together for good. Isn't that amazing? That gives us so much hope. When we see God saying wait or no, and it feels so long, and, and it feels like evil will prevail, God gives those who love him a promise, a hope that even these evil things will work together for good. Okay. Now we're going to start with Luke. And I'd like to pray with you. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we all have to look at your word together. I am so grateful that I have these followers, uh, these uh, people who uh, may have come to the Bible study but really want to uh, understand it better and so they're going over it again. Um, I also want to pray for those who uh, can't get to the Bible study yet still want to study your word. I thank you dear God that you are with them, that you will use your Holy Spirit to illuminate their minds so that they can understand that the what they learn in their minds will seep down into their hearts and blow out through their lives. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Okay, so now some of you will re uh, remember that we did this play at the end of last semester. But I really want to go over it because it's going to be the, uh, the kickoff, the stepping off of uh, what the rest of the book is all about. In fact, the two books, both Luke and Acts. So, um, I, I want you to read the release play. Can you do that for me? Uh, that's Luke 4 and release play. And uh, come back with me. Uh, but I want you to take note of one, a word. And that's the word Sabbath. Please watch for the word Sabbath. It's a very important word for this study. Okay, so you've done it. You paused and you've come returned. If you didn't, you could do it right now. Okay, let's look at our play. You remember it from last year. For those of you who are new, you don't remember it from last year, but now you've read it and you got it. And we know that Jesus... Uh, on a regular basis would come to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And this is a Sabbath day. And he goes to a synagogue. Now, we know that um, from Luke uh, that he, this isn't the first story in Jesus' ministry. It already tells you that he's uh, gone to other places and it was his custom to come into the synagogue and that people uh, all knew about the news of this great miracle worker and so he finally comes to his hometown and all the people are excited because this is their homeboy their hometown boy you know like a, a baseball player or a football player comes to his own hometown and everybody's cheering they want to see they want to have the you know, him sign the ball that they might have, or their tablet, and they're all excited. They're expecting him to do great things in their own town. And that's what they were expecting of Jesus Christ. And what does he do? He gives them scripture in the synagogue. Of course, they're all waiting for him to do the miracles, but they'll be patient. They'll listen to what he has to say. And it's what he has to say here that's becomes unbelievably important and is a stepping stone toward their their rejection. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61, 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, now watch this word, it's in dark in print, release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I want to look at that carefully because it's going to tell us uh, something about Jesus' ministry. Uh, you saw the repeated word, right? It was release. Well, what Jesus has done, and I explained this last year, but for those of you who are new, uh, I, a common practice amongst the rabbis of that day was to prove their point through scripture, which is what we do today. Uh, and they do it this way. They would take two scriptures, one from here, one from there, uh, and both these scriptures would have a common word. Uh, in this case, it's release. And to prove their point, they would juxtapose these two scriptures, and therefore they would have the two witnesses that they would need to prove their point. Oftentimes what happened was that these two scriptures were pulled out of context and really had nothing to do with each other, and they were put together like this. And what Jesus does is very different. He takes two scriptures. Both are from Isaiah, and both have to do with a common element, and that is the year of Jubilee. So both these scriptures, one from Isaiah 61, the other from Isaiah 58, both have to do with the year of Jubilee. The, and really, not the year, uh, so much the year of Jubilee as uh, uh, is talked about in Leviticus 25, although it is talking about that year of Jubilee, but the eschatological or the future year of Jubilee that the Messiah is going to bring in. Now, we're going to get into this. For those of you who are new, you're just saying to yourself, uh-oh, I don't know what she's talking about. Believe me, by the time this lesson is over, you're going to understand the year of Jubilee. And you're going to understand why Jesus used these two texts. What he did is he uh, quoted from Isaiah 61. But what the, the neat thing is, he took a line out and replace it with a line from Isaiah 58. Now he did that because in Isaiah 61 we have release, and Isaiah 58 we have the word release. And so he has those two catch words, right? But he's inserted rather than juxtaposed the two. He, and that's what they think is so gracious. I used to wonder, what in the world? Why would they say his words were gracious and be so enamored by what he said when all he was doing was quoting Isaiah 61? Really not quoting, he was reading it, which was common in that day. They read from the scriptures. And, uh, and so I, it used to perplex me. But when I realized what he was doing was a rabbinic thing, something the rabbis did, that he brought together two scriptures, uh, but he didn't juxtapose them. He brought these two scriptures with the catchword of release in them. And what he did was he took a, a line out from 60, uh, Isaiah 61 and inserted a line from Isaiah 58 so that the two catchwords were really... Uh, linked so tightly that you couldn't separate them. He did one step better than the rabbis. Yes, he did. And the reason is, so he wanted to emphasize this word release. Now let's look at that word release. If we look at the word first release, it says, He has sent me, Jesus, the Messiah, to proclaim release to the captives. What part of speech is that? Oh, I know, junior high grammar or even grade school grammar. Uh, your, your, your brains are a little fuzzy, can't remember, so I'll tell you, but some of you know. It's a noun, right? He's going to proclaim release. That's his message, release. 
but he's also going to do something else. The second release is what part of speech? You're right. It's a verb to release those who are pro, uh, oppressed. So what is Jesus saying about himself? He is going to preach release and do the releasing. He's going to be the releaser. He's going to preach release and he's going to do the releasing. Yes. See, that's why he took those two scriptures and put them together. He wanted to demonstrate what he was going to do throughout the book of Luke, throughout the ministry uh, that Jesus had. He is saying of himself, he's the proclaimer of release and the releaser himself. Uh, notice the it says in, in the last line of Isaiah, to proclaim, again proclaim, the acceptable year of the Lord. And uh, here the year of Jubilee is the acceptable year of the Lord. And he says no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. That's down here uh, under what Jesus says. So he's coming with the proclamation of a release, ready to release in the acceptable year, but he's the unacceptable Messiah. Now, what starts the rejection of Jesus? Well, he talks about himself as the Messiah, and the people of the town say, wait a second, what, isn't this just Joseph's son? See, he was saying he was the Messiah, and they're saying, wait a second, we, we know the whole story. We were here. Uh, he's just Joseph's son. Now, remember, we've been told who Jesus is the son of uh, already. Remember, Mary's told that Jesus would be the son of God. Uh, in the baptism of Jesus Christ, uh, the Father um, uh, speaks to Jesus, uh, you are my beloved Son. So Jesus is the Son of God there. And in the temptation scene uh, in the wilderness, remember what Satan says a couple times? If you are, and really that if is since, since you are the Son of God. So already we have this idea of, um, of uh, Jesus being rejected as the Son of God. So um, Jesus realizes that he's being rejected, says uh, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown in the acceptable year. So then uh, he's going to give two examples of that happening. But before I give you those two examples, let's talk about what uh, I said first. Um, why is this story, which isn't the first story, put first in Luke? In fact, um, it, in Mark and Matthew, this story occurs much later in their books. So why does Luke take it out of chronological order and place it here? Well, number one, let's talk about that chronological order. Uh, we like chronological order in Western civilization in our present day. But that wasn't the main thinking of the gospel writers nor the writers of that day. For them, it was not chronological order that was important, but what, uh, what was significant about that story was it was placed in a purposeful position. That story would be placed in a purposeful position. And so Luke takes the story and he purposefully pl makes it first, even though he's already told you he's all, that Jesus has been uh, preaching in other towns and healing in other towns. He puts this story first. Why? Because this story tells us what Jesus' 
purpose it is in the whole book. What's his purpose? To preach release and to be the releaser. And so through the whole book, people will be released. And I, some of you remember that uh, from last semester that that word release could be translated forgive. And so all through the book of uh, Luke, Jesus forgives, releases sinners. So every time you see the word forgive, go back to the word release because the word forgive comes from the word afiyami, and the word afiyami is the word release. So we can translate afiyami, release, or forgive. Every time you see the word forgive, know that Jesus is doing his job. He's releasing sinners from the guilt of their sin. Okay, so... Now let's look at the stories, and you just read them. There were two stories that Jesus gave that um, kind of were examples of what was happening to him that day. The first story comes from uh, the story of Elijah. And um, at a time when a famine came into the land, and... Um, and yet, and Elijah was sent to whom? A woman of Sidon. Now, Sidon is north of the northern kingdom. Elijah was a northern kingdom prophet, and the northern kingdom people who had split from the southern kingdom were idolaters. They were Jews, but they were idolaters. They were... Israelites, but they uh, worship Baal and Murdoch and uh, a number of the uh, foreign gods. Yeah, even their kings did that. And so Elijah went to a widow of Sidon, a Gentile widow. Why did he go to a Gentile widow when there were plenty of Israelite widows in Israel? Because they had rejected Yahweh. And therefore rejected Elijah, and therefore he turned to the Gentiles. The second story comes from Elisha. He too, both Elijah and Elisha, were northern kingdom prophets. Now, it's so interesting because Jesus, as he's in Nazareth, is in the area of the northern kingdom. So, of course, these people of Nazareth and Capernaum and all the regions of Galilee, they would have taken Elijah and Elisha as their patron saints or their patron prophets and have loved them. And so Jesus, of course, takes those two stories of Elijah and Elisha. And the second story about Elisha is about uh, the Syrian uh, Naaman, Naaman. And uh, there were plenty of lepers in, in Israel, weren't there? But who does he heal? A Syrian, a Gentile, yes, a Gentile, instead of an Israel. So when Jesus presents his ministry and he is rejected by the townspeople, he says, this is just like in the time of Elijah and Elisha. You know, when they were rejected, when Yahweh was rejected there, they turned to the Gentiles. Oh, it is now that they want to kill him. They want to throw him off a cliff. They're so angry. And why are they angry? Well, the reason why they're angry is because uh, 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 they have gone through so much trauma for the last 600 years. First, these Syrians come over the Fertile Crescent and take into captivity those in the northern kingdom and take them back to Assyria. Those people are never heard from again. Then uh, approximately 150 years later, the Babylonians come from the Fertile Crescent, take over Assyria and Syria, come down to the southern kingdom where Jerusalem is, where Bethlehem is, and they take the people from there 
as Jeremiah said, killing the babies, leaving mothers destitute, taking those people back into Babylon, away from their land, making them slaves. And then, it, not only that, but the next group, the, the, the Persians, take over and keep the people enslaved. Yes, they're allowed to go back to their land, but it's not their land. It's the king of Persia's land. They are not their own. They are still slaves. And they say so in their prayers. We are slaves. And then they, uh, the next group is the Greeks. Remember Antiochus Epiphanes who brings in the pig, the swine into the holy place. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, after the Greeks, it, the Romans, and they are still enslaved by Gentiles. They hate the Gentiles. And here is Jesus saying that their patron prophets turn to the Gentiles when the Jewish people, the Israelites, turned away from God and turned toward um, idolatry. And now Jesus is saying the same thing is going to happen again because they are rejecting him as the son of God. And the people go in an uproar and take him out of the city. Now, why did Luke put this story first? Well, we saw that it it was a story that told what Jesus' ministry would be throughout the rest of the, in fact, not only through Luke, but in Acts. Jesus is the great releaser, and uh, he will preach releasing. And now, second reason why it's placed first is it's going to tell why the gospel will go to the Gentiles. And when does that happen? Not so much in the book of Luke, but Luke's second book, Acts. It prepares us by showing that God's own people reject Jesus, and now the message is going to go to the Gentiles, which occurs halfway through the book of Acts. Right. So this story is really programmatic. It tells what is going to happen. That's why Luke puts it first. So let's go back to this uh, Jubilee thing. And what I want you to do now, it, your paper says at the top, Jubilee, year of release, and there's three columns. So if you were to go to Je uh, Leviticus 25 and uh, read about the, the, the Jubilee, um, and then to Jeremiah 34, and again, Jubilee is being set aside, not being followed. And Jeremiah is telling them, um, you know, you better do this Jubilee. And then Isaiah, you know, he takes this idea of Jubilee and translates it into a prophecy about the future Messiah who will bring in the year of Jubilee. So read those three columns, pause this, read the three columns, and then come back. Here's what I want you to do, though, first. You're going to underline, circle, do different colors if you have the your twistables. These words, Jubilee, write that down. The number 50, write that down. The word Sabbath, and the word seven. Okay, go to it, and then return. Glad you're back. Okay, if we were to read the first column again, and we will a little bit, we would see that word Sabbath replayed, replayed, replayed. And that's extremely important. Because Sabbath comes from the very beginning of your scriptures from the very first book, Genesis, because God rests on the seventh day. And then later in Torah, uh, he sets aside that seventh day as a day of rest. And now the year of Jubilee, which is what you circled, is going to, um, is, uh, 
the, the foundation for the year of Jubilee is the Sabbath. It's dependent on the sevens of Sabbath. Yeah, some of you noticed that uh, uh, Sabbath, Sabbath, three times it says Sabbath, Sabbath. It won't show you that in your English translations because people would think it was a typo. We don't usually repeat like the Hebrew people did. But this was so important that the repetition was given because this is a Sabbath of Sabbaths this year of Jubilee. And um, notice the words that are emboldened in this story. Proclaim, release. This was a year of Jubilee. And what would be released? The land. Okay. Say for, uh, you know that the land was divided up into the 12 uh, tribes. You know that from um, Joshua and, um, and from Torah, that um, the land was divided. It was also divided up uh, by families. Each family had their own plot of land. Well, if a family uh, came into hard times, uh, they didn't, uh, when they couldn't pay their bills, uh, they, they didn't go into jail as people did in for hundreds of years in the past. Uh, uh, they, they couldn't um, uh, uh, declare bankruptcy. What they did was they gave their land to uh, the one they owed the money to. And uh, that land was held on to until uh, the person could pay back their money. But if they couldn't, um, if they couldn't pay back in the year of Jubilee, their debt was released. It was like you getting, uh, 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 you you have thousands of dollars, say, on your visa, and you're saying, "How am I going to pay this back? Oh no, my credit rating will go up in smoke, and I don't have the money." And you getting a a letter from Visa or American Express saying no more debt it's been paid in full you've been released whoa would you celebrate that was the year of release another way that people could pay their debts was to uh, 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 give themselves over to the person who uh, they owed the debt to give themselves over as a slave and they would remain a slave until the debt was paid off unless the year of Jubilee came along. And this was, year of Jubilee was based on Sabbaths. Remember that? And there was a release. And they were released. Debts and land. and that It was just a wonderful year of release. And in fact, it says this is a year, the 50th year. Proclaiming release. Now, in the second column, what was it that showed you that uh, Jeremiah is decrying the fact that in the Jubilee year, the people were not set free, the slaves. Their, their uh, fellow Hebrew people who were slaves paying off debts were not being released. Uh, what do we? Uh, what is said in this column that tells us that um, it was the jubilee year? You saw it. Proclaim, release. Jubilee. That was the year that things were set free. Did you see that? Set free, set free, set them free, set free. Four times we're told what release meant. Set them free. Release them from their bondage. They don't, you, you saw the story. They set them free when Jeremiah says, a calamity is coming. Uh, people are coming in to invade us. Uh, do you see the soldiers? And the people saw that 
uh, one of the kingdoms was coming in to to destroy them, and they they got real quick to oh God, we're sorry. Oh God, uh, Yahweh, uh, forgive us. Uh, we will release our slaves, and they released the slaves. But when the calamity went away, they took back their slaves. And of course, we know uh, later in the story, the Babylonian captivity came along, mostly because they wouldn't release. Now, Isaiah takes this idea of jubilee and kind of turns it a little and gives it an eschatological idea. And so he's, he tells us that Messiah is coming and going to bring release. He's going to proclaim release. Did you see that here? Did you see the words proclaim the proclaim release in Isaiah 61 and then in Isaiah 58 and to release the oppressed? He's saying the picture in Leviticus 25 about the Jubilee is going to picture what will happen in the future when Messiah comes. And isn't that exactly what Jesus preached? He preached these words in the synagogue in his own hometown. The spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and freedom to prisoners and to release the oppressed. And that's what Jesus said. He's bringing in the Jubilee. They're going to reject Jesus, aren't they? So... We're going to see the book as Jesus announcing the Jubilee year, the year of release. It was based on the 50th year in uh, Leviticus. And that 50th year was based on the Sabbath days. And do you remember which day Jesus preached this message from Isaiah? It was on a Sabbath. He came on the Sabbath preaching. The Sabbath of Sabbaths was here. The year of Jubilee. The acceptable year. And he was not acceptable. Now let's look at one more thing. Because Jesus not only released through the forgiveness of sins, but he released, he was going to release those who needed to be healed those who were in bondage even to Satan. So I want you to uh, put this on pause, please, and read the three stories here. It's called Releasing the Oppressed. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to circle release. Write that down. Oppressed. Write that down. Satan or devil. And Sabbath. Can you do that? Thank you. Pause and come back to us. Okay, you have returned. And uh, we saw in the first column, I quoted it again. And did you notice release and oppressed in those two? Good. Because in the next story, we see Jesus releasing, don't we? Again, in chapter 13 of Luke, we have uh, the fact that it's on the Sabbath. Not only that, but the word Sabbath is repeated five times. It's like Luke is saying, here we go again. Here we go. It's on the Sabbath. And guess what happens to this woman in bondage to Satan, bent over her life, adore, uh, in her life, bound for 18 years to Satan. Well, <laughs> she's released. Did you see the word release? On the Sabbath. Yes, Luke is coming back to his original thing, isn't he? He's reminding us with the repetition of the word Sabbath that this is a jubilee. Jesus is going to release on the Sabbath day. And, of course, the last 
the third uh, column talks about something that happens in Acts 10 because it's going to say the same through Acts too because that's the second of Luke's books. And uh, Luke chapter 4 is preparing us for not just the book of Luke but for Acts. And so in Acts 10, uh, Peter gets up and he's going to do, uh, he's going to preach, and he preaches about Jesus. It tells about Jesus, and it's the last part that's most important. So go down to 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Remember, Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at the baptism, at his baptism, and he received power according to Luke. Remember that? Um uh, he, Jesus, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed. Remember the word oppressed back here? We know the word release, but that we also have release to those who are oppressed. And here we have it again. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. Just as the woman was bound by the de devil and was released. The other people were uh, 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 um, oppressed by the devil and Jesus healed them. See how Luke's two books are going to demonstrate that Jesus is proclaiming release and he is the great releaser. So, we don't often see people who are bound by Satan today. I mean, uh, I, I had one person say, well, drug addiction kind of pictures uh, that being bound to Satan. And I would grant that. But we don't often see demon-possessed people being released. Uh, third world countries where Satan's work might be uh, uh, alive and well. Uh, but on a daily basis, we don't see this. Uh, so I want to make this a little more practical because we're going to see next week that a common oppression uh, by Satan in Jesus' day and our day is the oppression of temptation. We are oppressed daily by Satan who wants us to be bound by temptation. Okay? So, we're going to see that next week. And um, God bless you. I had a wonderful time. Father in heaven, thank you that Jesus is the great releaser. We've been released. We've been released from um, our, our sin and uh, forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Help us to remember these stories about Jesus as we go through temptation and we realize that Jesus is even going to help release us from temptation. In Christ's precious name, amen. Thank you. See you next week.